Welcome back to the Clean Energy Revolution. I am Carolyn Kassan and delighted to, to spend uh, the next few minutes with you talking about solar energy. Uh, the sun provides plenty of energy, 342 watts for every square meter of the earth to be exact. That is information according to NASA. So how do we harness its power? Photovoltaic or PV, solar cells are versatile and scalable. But there are limits. The relatively low efficiency, which is about 20% of solar panels, has always been a bottleneck. But this is improving all the time. And costs continue to fall. Since 2010 in the UK, costs have fallen by 82% in the last decade. There's still a great need for innovation in the industry. We need to look at new ways to capture the energy, especially when it comes to the sun and distribute it where it is needed the most. On the show today, we are going to explore some of these new technologies. Where should investors and governments be looking? In November 2023, one such industry started generating a lot of buzz no pun intended, sorry, a type of solar cell made from perovskite, a material that absorbs different wavelengths of light from the usual silicone, which we're all used to, and it actually set a record for efficiency. The previous record had lasted just five months and will likely be broken again not long after, probably, we record today's podcast. 95% of solar cells around the world are made from what we're used to, silicone. But when you make a panel using a mixture of silicone and perovskite, you utilise more of the solar spectrum, producing a lot more electricity. The efficiency of silicon cells top out around the 30% mark. Perovskite only sits about 26%, but when you mix both of these, you get a new record of about 33% in testing. And this is taking an old material and a new material, layering them together and getting a much more energy efficient product. And this is something that we are going to be chatting to one of our guests in the podcast to a little bit later. Using new materials for solar cells is one way the solar industry is transforming and driving efficiencies stretchable solar cells are another innovation. In Korea and Australia, solar panels made of organic polymers are delivering 19% efficiency. It's opened up a world of possibilities. Think about wearable solar. And panels made to fit existing buildings that traditional solar panels wouldn't have fit. We are going to focus on two of the most exciting technological breakthroughs in solar power on today's show. The future of solar power might lie in minerals that sit under our feet, but, and this is what we'll explore today, it might float off our shores on floating solar farms sending clean energy back to land. Let's start close to home. I'm in New York, where the impacts of the Inflation Reduction Act and its tax incentives for the solar industry have led to record growth. Capacity was up 51% from 2022 to 2023, with 32.4 gigawatts installed last year. I want to repeat that, 32.4 gigawatts installed last year. Utility-scale solar installations were up 77% on 2022. Pretty incredible numbers. So what's driving growth this year? What can we expect from the rest of the year in the solar industry? And what technologies on land, sea, and in space are we investing in? Becca Jones Albertus is director of the Department of Energy Solar Energies Technology Office. They fund and research new technology for the industry. Hi, Becca. It's so great to have you joining the Clean Energy Revolution podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time. Really excited to talk to you about what's happening uh, in, around solar here in the United States. So to get started, tell us about the solar market in the United States. Uh, where's the growth and where's the funding coming from? Yes. Thanks so much for having me, Carolyn. I love talking about uh, the solar market. It's such an incredibly exciting time right now. Solar is growing uh, year over year just tremendously in this country. Uh, we had 6% of our electricity from solar last year with deployment uh, record-breaking 32 gigawatts. Um, and so it, it's incredibly exciting to see solar growing so rapidly, but also we're focused on really getting to a clean 
energy grid. And that is a grid that's going to need a lot more solar than we have today. It's a grid that's going to be powered by solar, wind, and battery storage. And so we need to get solar from maybe 6% of our electricity today to 40% or more. So there's a, there's a lot of growth we still need to be looking toward in the, uh, in the decade to come. But we've seen tremendous growth. And that growth over the last 10 to 15 years has been driven by falling prices in solar. We saw solar prices between 2010 and 2020 fall by a factor of five for large scale systems and also by um, clean energy goals being set by states, local governments, companies, uh, and the continuation of tax credits through the Inflation Reduction Act will provide a stable um, incentive space that will continue to support growth and deployment over the coming decade. It's amazing. Yeah, no, it is. I mean, I tell my students all the time how extraordinary the growth has been over a relatively short period of time. Quick follow up question to go from six to that 40 percent. What is the timeline that you're looking at? The president set a goal of getting to a decarbonized grid by 2035. And so for solar, that means we'd have to continue to increase deployment 20 percent year over year to get to about 100 gigawatts a year of solar on the grid by 2030, and then kind of continue deploying at those kinds of levels, 100 gigawatt levels uh, into the future. So that, that's how we get there. Excellent. Well, on that then, so what's, you know, what about the technology? What are you most excited by? Uh, solar technology gets better every year, which is very exciting. We have seen solar panels become uh, more efficient year over year, about a half a percent per year on average. We see uh, the trackers that align the panels to most optimally uh, get sunlight on lar our large utility scale systems. We've seen that technology improving year over year. We see modules getting larger. We see um, lots of changes in, in what's getting installed each year to make these systems better. Lifetimes are getting longer. We're seeing some companies warrantying systems for 35 years or longer. We are aiming to see large solar systems that last for 50 years. And so we're seeing lifetime get better as well. So lots of change each year. Um, at DOE, we're investing in next generation technologies that can stack two different uh, solar cells on top of each other. We call those tandem solar cells. Um, one idea is to take uh, a new material called perovskite and put that basically on top of today's solar cell technology to get to even higher efficiencies. So that's um, one place where we're investing tens of millions of dollars each year to develop that as a new technology. We're also seeing new markets uh, deploying solar, uh, for example, on uh, farmland with agricultural production. So that's one thing I'm very excited about is looking at how we can configure solar energy systems so that they can be co-located with uh, animal grazing, um, with pollinator species to support uh, agricultural production on adjacent lands or with crops uh, themselves. So we've been investing a lot in what we call agrivoltaics, uh, which can involve kind of significant technology changes or much more modest technology changes, uh, sometimes uh, almost no change at all in the technology that's being installed, but very thoughtful uh, land management practices to really uh, optimize those systems. I love that. I'm smiling because I had a student last spring who did his uh, graduate thesis on agrivoltaics. He was really excited by it. And it was just fantastic to sort of see as how it's uh, how it's being deployed and how it will be deployed. So on the subject of um, the kind of very advanced technologies, um, coming up, my co-host, Laura, is speaking with Sam Adlin, who's CEO of UK-based Space Solar. So what are your thoughts on solar energy being captured in space? There is interest in uh, collecting solar energy from space and then using uh, radio waves or other types of waves to transmit that power to Earth. Um, that technology may be a good option for getting power to really remote regions that have no uh, transmission or grid infrastructure where it could be very expensive to set up other power sources um, and maybe you know very mountainous terrain. So you wouldn't want to be deploying solar in, in that region itself. Uh, I, I personally think it's very unlikely that we'll see that technology be a major source of power uh, terrestrially here on Earth, but it is a very interesting idea. 
I agree. I think the costs are particularly prohibitive right now and probably very much uh, over the next uh, 10, 20 years. So, but thank you for that. Um, where should we be investing uh, to drive solar, uh, the rollout of solar? So if you have like, what's, what are, what's the best use of funds? Where should they go so that we will hit that 40% as you, um, as you addressed earlier in, in the episode? Yeah, we get to look at that every day of Department of Energy as we're investing our uh, 300 uh, plus million dollars of taxpayer dollars to try to accelerate solar deployment and advance technology. And there's no silver bullet. There's no, oh, if we just do this one thing, we will uh, immediately um, you know, ex- accelerate solar deployment. There's a, a bunch of different uh, barriers we need to address and new markets we need to open. So um, we need to continue to advance technologies to make them last longer and, and be more efficient. We uh, as well want to be thinking about what happens to these technologies at the end of life, how we set them up for recycling and a circular economy. That's one area we invest in a lot. Um, we need to solve challenges like interconnection. Uh, today, we have enough solar projects and storage projects in interconnection queues to get to a completely decarbonized energy system. And yet, those projects uh, right now take more than five years to get through interconnection queues. Um, less than one in five actually continue and, and make it through those queues. So, um, and Those timelines are um, really hindering project growth. So we need to get to faster, fairer, simpler interconnection processes. Uh, We need to continue to have industry working closely with communities on developing solar projects that bring benefits to those communities so that we uh, continue to see more and more sites open up and and communities that are interested in welcoming solar. Um, We also want to work to make solar energy much more accessible. And so for anyone who wants to have the opportunity to save money by using solar to produce their electricity at home, whether that's directly on their rooftop or through something like community solar, they have the opportunity to do so. Many, many other issues, secure supply chains, workforce training. There's a lot of work to do to continue to uh, grow solar, but um, we've got the foundations in place and it's all possible. Excellent. So on that, I know you're, you know, you're with the Department of Energy. So kind of understanding the role of policy and understanding specifically U.S. government policy, you know, where has energy policy in the United States contributed most to solar growth, you know, most particularly around um, uh, utility scale? Solar actually, solar deployment worldwide has been heavily spurred by government policies, and that's true in the U.S. as well. Uh, The investment tax credit at the federal level has been a major driver of solar deployment. That's a 30 percent tax credit. It has stepped down in recent years, but with the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act um, two years ago, it has extended it at that 30 percent range um, and also opened up the production tax credit to solar. So those are very significant incentives. And then at the state and local level, we see um, renewable energy targets. Um, We see other grant programs. There's a whole diversity of different incentives that have grown markets. Uh, New Jersey, for example, um, 10 or so years ago was one of the first major uh, rooftop solar markets, and that was driven by policies in that state. But we've seen a, a, a diversity of different states who have developed different policies over the past decade or so. And so what we're seeing as a result of that is that we've got solar deployment across the country. It's growing rapidly in California and Hawaii, but also in the Southeast, uh, the Midwest. Um, Solar is a technology that really works everywhere in this country, and we are seeing markets develop and deployment grow across the country, which is exciting. It is so exciting. I love, I mean, I love also bringing this into my classroom and students are really excited. They're very like eager to get involved and work in the, um, in the solar space. So thanks for all the work you're doing at the DOE. Uh, so kind of, we talked, uh, you, you just talked about utility scale. So residential solar, where does government funding need to go to increase capacity um, at the residential level? So today we have about 5 million households who have solar on their roofs, and that's about um, 3% of all households in this country have solar. And so it is growing rapidly, but that's uh, you know 97% of households that, that do not have solar on the roof, some because they are renting and don't have 
have access to a roof and, and some because uh, they haven't chosen to, to go solar yet or the financing is challenging. And there are um, a number of pieces there. We want to make it easier and cheaper to go solar. So that um, means continuing to work toward automated permitting, um, automated interconnection. We've supported the development of the solar app, which is uh, an automated permitting software that local governments can adopt to enable uh, permitting processes to be instantaneous and easy. So adoption of that is increasing. That makes it easier um, to go through the process of going solar when, when you want to go solar. Uh, obviously, policies and incentives can play a major role in the um, 30% investment tax credit uh, is, is very helpful to households who, who want to go solar. Um, and then state and local policies there as well. Uh, we also think a lot about um, community solar when we start to talk residential. So again, for the 50% of households who, who rent or can't access financing to put solar on their own roof, we want them to have those opportunities to save money, to have um, greater energy resilience, uh, perhaps by locating a larger solar array on a uh, community building. And so through that, um, if that building's located in their community, there can be resilience opportunities when it's paired with storage. And then with the right agreements with utilities, um, households can treat that as though that solar energy system is on their own roof. And so that offers them the same opportunities. And from an equity perspective, that's really, really important. Um, so we're working on that as well. And for both community solar and rooftop solar, you know, consumer protection is also important. We want to ensure that consumers who want to go solar understand what they're signing up for and um, have, you know, good terms and arrangements. And so that's an area where we're also continuing to think about investing in as well as new financing mechanisms to continue to make it easier for people to access the capital to go solar. Yeah, it's excellent. It was really exciting to hear, uh, you know, Biden's announcement of uh, solar for all that he announced on Earth Day. That was uh, it was it was great. So it's wonderful to see everything that's coming out of the U.S. government, your your you know the Department of Energy and uh, such phenomenal work. So thank you so very much for joining us today. We really appreciate your um, your wonderful insights. And again, I just want to affirm and reiterate my uh, my gratitude for everyone, uh, uh, you know, in your office, because uh, as I said, I bring this into my classrooms. And uh, it's exciting for students to, to understand, um, you know, the incredible growth that's happening. And for our audience on the Clean, uh, Clean Energy Revolution podcast, we really appreciate your time today. Well, thank you so much, Carolyn. And so glad that you're helping get our next generation excited because that's so important uh, as we continue to move forward. We need lots of great minds. Thank you very much. Now let's look as far away from home as it's possible to get thousands of miles above us in geostationary orbit. Space-based solar is attracting a lot of attention and investment at the moment, but the concept is not new. In 1923, a Russian scientist proposed using a system of mirrors to beam sunlight to the earth to assist with cooking. A hundred years later, the ambitions of the European Space Agency are slightly more bold. They've created Solaris, an initiative to test the viability of space-based solar ahead of a decision to create a full development programme next year in 2025. Some say, however, that the technology is not only viable, it's not that difficult to do. A 2021 study from the UK government found that space-based solar could generate up to 10 gigawatts, a sixth of peak energy demand. Funding of 4.3 million was distributed to eight projects focused on developing space-based solar technology. One of the recipients was Space Solar, a company based in Oxford. Sam Adlin is CEO at the firm. He explains that solar panels operating in space see greater efficiency. So, simple enough? Build a solar panel about a kilometre in width, hoist it into space and get the energy back on Earth? Not quite. Concepts for space-based solar panels would be the biggest thing humanity has put into space. Construction would require new engineering processes to make it cost-effective. Nevertheless, it is exciting. With private companies like SpaceX 
and Blue Origin stepping in to fill the void left by NASA's declining space programme, launching tons of material into space is possible, even if it isn't currently cost effective or environmentally sound. A 2021 study from the UK government found that space-based solar could generate up to 10 gigawatts, a sixth of peak energy demand. Funding of 4.3 million was distributed to eight projects focused on developing this space-based solar technology. So exciting. And I'm absolutely thrilled that one of the recipients was Space Solar, probably one of the coolest names for a company that, w- that is out there. And it's based in Oxford. And I'm joined by Sam Adlin, who is co-CEO at the firm. Sam, hello and welcome. Hi, Laura. Great to uh, great to meet you. Now, space-based solar. Tell me all about it. It sounds promising. Why is it so promising? And what are some of the you know, advantages of, I guess, terrestrial solar that we're so used to here on planet Earth? In the sun, we've got a, a huge long-term clean energy source. So space solar power is really about how we harness that in, in ways that allow us to meet our, our the, the energy needs of the 21st century. It's long been considered the ultimate clean energy technology, and it's got a number of really compelling features. So first, it provides that baseload energy. Um, you're up in a high earth orbit, you see the sun all the time, which means you get that 24-7 baseload power. It's then incredibly flexible. So not only is it dispatchable, so you can tune the amount of power, which is really important in terms of optimizing the sort of overall energy system but you can also see a third of the earth's surface and instantaneously switch the beam between any point within the field of view so you can start to completely reimagine the way the grid works and then finally it's incredibly scalable um, so these systems are comprised of hundreds of thousands of dinner plate sized modules assembled in a gigafactory but manufactured so I'll better do that again uh, these systems are comprised of hundreds of thousands of the same dinner plate size modules produced in a gigafactory and assembled in a flow process in space, which means we can put up tens of gigawatts a year. And so when you look at it compared with terrestrial solar, firstly, it's very complementary. So it actually helps the intermittent renewables work because you can you can balance the grid. It means you don't need to, to overbuild. But you're getting from the the studies that have been done, you're getting a, a levelized cost of electricity that's similar to the intermittent renewables, but it's providing that baseload energy. You've got a, a capex cost of about a quarter of nuclear, and then its environmental footprint's really strong, and, and studies predict um, a, a foot carbon footprint about half that of terrestrial solar. That's so interesting to hear about this technology and definitely the point about, you know, solar people worry what happens when the sun is not around. I'm from Scotland, that's most of the time, but we know that obviously it can be really effective. But what you said about the sun, space, it's just such a great opportunity to harness that energy. But before we go any further, okay, I'm imagining just a giant solar panel floating about in space. I'm hoping that that is the case because that'd be really cool. But, you know, Sam, how does this technology actually work? That's actually a, a pretty good um, pretty good analogy there, Laura. So, yes, it, it, rather than putting your solar panels on the ground, you, you, you put them up in space. And you put them up in space for a few reasons. Firstly, they see the sun all the time, which we've discussed. And then secondly, they get 13 times more incident energy Um compared to a solar panel on the ground for, for, for a solar panel in the UK. And that sort of drives the really compelling economic. So in, in terms of how it works then, you've got these large uh, solar arrays up in space, um, they're kilometer scale, and then you convert that energy into high frequency radio waves, into microwaves, and beam that down to earth in, in a coherent beam through a transparent window in the, in, 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 in the atmospheric spectrum to a receiving antenna where it's reconverted and an input to the grid. And you know, ever since the 1960s, this has been a technology that's been considered technically feasible. It's the economics that have changed massively in the last decade with the onset of heavy reusable launch. Um, and that's what's led governments around the world now to be extremely interested in the features and opportunities around space-based solar power. 
Wow. I mean, yeah, really exciting. And I feel, you know, you go back to school, you learn about renewable energy, you learn about all these microwaves and everything that you're talking about. But I don't think space solar was something I thought about as a kid. So it's exciting just to see how far we are pushing innovation when it comes to the kind of clean energy revolution. You mentioned a little bit about economics and costs. And I'm just wondering, you know, where are your concepts and forecasts coming from? You know, how can we all ac you know, accurately predict the cost of this electricity? So there have been uh, three independent studies done in the last couple of years by various governments around the world. They've all come to fairly similar conclusions. And um, by building up a, a, a very detailed cost model that can feed into the economics, so they, they can all come out with some... Um, with expectations around that levelised cost of electricity. Uh, the, com the study that was done for UK government was done by a company called Fraser Nash. Uh, they used a, a, a statistical model. Um, so you could uh, <clears throat> look at different um, different scenarios for key cost drivers in the, in, in the system. And it's the sort of the 50th percentile, the, the sort of average um, uh, position that, 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 that we take and we've based our our assumptions on so there's a lot of upside potential as well particularly if launch costs continue to uh, continue to drop and i think the thing to to, to really focus on though are, the, are perhaps the key cost drivers because with them um, with any system there are some factors that are more important than others and for space-based solar power the key cost driver is really the cost of launch that that combined with the cost of financing so if you've got a pretty tight handle on those things you can be very confident on the source of outputs you're going to get. Yeah, fascinating. And one of the keywords that I jumped on there was launch. You know, when we think about this technology, it's something that is definitely new. You know, where do you see this technology being in 10 years? And when could a realistic launch date be? So for Space Solar, we're focused on moving as swiftly as possible to delivering meaningful power from space. And our, our first uh, our first power station in space is delivered after six years. That's in a low Earth orbit, delivering six megawatts. So it's intermittent power at that stage. But that will have proved the concept end to end. And that's that's the point where we then move to developing commercial power stations. We've got two product lines. One's a 180 megawatt system from a high Earth orbit. We'll be delivering commercial power from that for the first time after nine years. And then gigawatt scale power uh, for base load from a single satellite after 12 years um, from a geostationary orbit. So we've got a development plan that uh, that takes us on that journey. And key key milestones in, in the early years are around ground to air power beaming. And then we do a kilowatt scale in space demonstrator. But I think the key message is that this can be delivered on net zero time scales. Um, and not only that, but very, very swiftly scaled up after that yeah and i think obviously net zero targets are so important and something that is very much a hot topic uh, all around the world and i think particularly innovation is the word that's used all the time when we talk about net zero we need innovation to be reaching them and it feels like space solar sits right in that sweet spot of you know taking a concept that we know a lot about solar panels but of course really trying to see how we can maximize it and and get the best out of it and you know thinking about you know solar panels are something we are all very familiar with lots of houses now have them on top of their roofs it's something you know we're getting to grips with but i guess for space based solar are there any lessons that we've been able to learn from the terrestrial solar that we've been able to use when thinking about space-based solar and, and how are we advancing that technology? So we need to find ways to work between the public and private sector to bring these new technologies to bear as soon as possible for, for all of us. We've got to give ourselves options and this is a fantastic option to have as part of the future energy mix. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it sounds exciting. It's always fun to think about space and think about clean energy. But I suspect it's probably not been all smooth sailing when trying to embark on this. What are some of the barriers that you're facing, either with the technology, with the concept, or even just the barriers thinking about that potential launch dates in the future, where you're going to try and, and really show that this, this is something that is going to work? So this is a it's a it's a big engineering challenge. I think one of the key points is that the the physics is all completely understood. So unlike some potential energy solutions, that puts us in a really good place. In in that context, 
there's a lot of value to be created on the journey and a lot of upside just from just from going on the uh, on the development path, including things like terrestrial wireless power transmission. But um, there's probably three main challenge areas. There are um, obviously areas around technological development. Most of the key component technologies have been demonstrated at um, at at, at, uh, <clears throat> at low level and, and just need scaling up. So the wireless power transmission technology is a key one, but that was demonstrated at kilowatt scale over kilometers back in the 1970s with the right efficiencies. Got then <clears throat> in space uh, robotic assembly is a, is a key thing, which is advancing really, really quickly. Uh, regulations probably the long pole in the tent. Uh, <clears throat> the UK government's made some some great strides, bringing all the key regulators together around that. But that will require international partnership and international working. And um, again, it's it's important. We've been told that it's it's certainly possible on the timescales that we've just described, but it will require political will. And then the third one's probably financing, which we've which we've discussed. That they are also then. You know, when when you're talking about any new energy technology, there are, there are skeptics. But certainly, when you talk about something that people often, perhaps, naturally associate with sci-fi like space, there 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 are there are skeptics in in, in that regard. There's um, you know we've got to work to do to to bring the general public on the journey in terms of acceptance of, of wireless power transmission. There have been challenges with something like five G, so beaming power from space. It's you know, it's it's designed to be safe. The whole system is designed bottom up so that the maximum intensity is a quarter of the midday sun, and you know, actually at the outside the receiving antenna it's well below the the long term <clears throat> background microwave exposure limits. But there's 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 work to do. But actually there's huge benefits on the journey. It's a, you know, pr- provides a huge opportunity for a, for a bright future for for all of us, and it's great to see both governments and and the private sector now coming around this to make it a reality. Yeah, I think that's such an important point. And that's something throughout this podcast we've been talking about is how important communication and language, even maybe storytelling is when we talk about the clean energy revolution in total, you know, looking at all the different schemes, but particularly when you put your toe into the water of innovation, you need to bring people along with you. You know, we've had such a huge change in the way that we produce our energy and it's important to bring communities and individuals along so that we, you know, understand it all the way up to those policymakers and politicians, you know, to really get them to see the vision and see the excitement. And I guess I'm just wondering, you know, when you're out at the weekend, you go to the pub and someone says, all right, mate, how are you doing? What do you do? What's your job? What's people's reactions when you say, I'm in this thing called space solar. It's actually been incredibly positive. I think uh, more and more people recognise the challenges ahead of us. They recognise um, innovation. They recognise the potential in all of this. And actually, the Royal Society did some work um, with, with Ipsos, sort of surveying the general public, and space solar power is one of the things that they that they talked about. And again generally really really positive about what this can deliver and um you know acceptance of 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 this is a this is a future solution there's a huge amount of work to do to to bring people together along along the journey but actually together we can we can deliver this we can deliver it for a bright future for the planet but also we can deliver huge benefits in terms of economic prosperity for the uk as well so there's um big big opportunities ahead but as, as you say we've really got a um, really focus on that that communication the storytelling bringing people with us ensuring it's safe ensuring it delivers um everything that it says it will and um making sure we really do have not just a net zero impact but a, you know, a, a holistic positive impact on the world yeah absolutely and i can just imagine lots of kids in a classroom thinking that is the coolest thing ever that's the job that i want to do when i'm older when we talk about you know a green future we're talking about for generations to come so it's amazing to see how this economy of of green industry can thrive well sam thank you so much for coming on to the clean energy revolution podcast and talking about it may be one of the coolest things that we'll talk about this season um i feel you've you've maybe got that title so thank you so much and yeah really looking forward to see what you get up to and of course we will keep Keep our eyes peeled for space solar as you get ever closer to the days where you get to launch this new technology. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Laura. There's still a huge gulf between concept and viability. Amory Levins, physicist and adjunct professor at Stanford, says efforts would be best focused on developing terrestrial solar. The energy we could get from space doesn't justify the cost 
of getting the panels up there. Why spend money on something that has no chance of a business case if you succeeded, whose need will have been met before you could build it, and whose most optimistic future cost estimates are the same as the current price of terrestrial solar power plus batteries? He said this to CNN at the end of last year. A lot. Uh, there's so much interesting research. Jesse Jenkins at Princeton University um, has built out really interesting net zero models for the United States that includes a uh, portfolio of options, solar plus batteries. Uh, so I think for the time being, we'll be looking at uh, terrestrial solar and potentially, uh, potentially later in this century, um, space-based solar. Floating solar is another option. The UK government is aiming for a five-fold increase in solar capacity by 2035. It's a small country, though, and solar arrays on farmland could be banned. Despite estimates that just 0.4% of all land in the UK would be covered by solar to hit 2050 net zero targets. So where do you put the panels? Jonathan Gifford is editor-in-chief of at PV Magazine and founder of Climate Copy. He joins Laura now to discuss the viability of floating solar and the potential for solar around the world. A solar array that chases the sun and can supplement offshore wind power, as well as withstanding rough conditions out to sea, is an exciting concept. Jonathan spoke to Laura to discuss the viability of floating solar. Hello, Jonathan. Welcome to the Clean Energy Revolution podcast. How are you? Hi, Laura. Um, very well. Thank you very much for having me. No, you're very welcome. And it's such an exciting topic today because we are talking about solar, solar energy, uh, something that is particularly on today when the sun is actually out where I am in Scotland, something I get excited about. But I'm just wondering, you know, from your perspective, what are some of the trends that we are seeing when it comes to solar technologies in the UK? Okay, in the UK. So I think First of all, we have to keep in mind that um, the vast bulk of solar manufacturing, particularly when it comes to the solar panel, the solar module, is in China now. So that's where the bulk of the innovation occurs, I would say. Of course, Europe, North America, um, Australia, these places, they have really world-renowned solar research laboratories and research institutes and teams. But really, when it comes to the commercialization and the manufacturing of solar technology, really at very big scales, it's all it's all China these days. But if you're talking the UK, there's one very interesting company from the UK called Oxford PV. And they're, uh, as the name kind of denotes, an Oxford University spinoff. And they're commercializing perovskite material, which is a kind of new solar photovoltaic material, relatively new. Um, It was only discovered that it actually had photovoltaic qualities or properties relatively recently. And in a very short space of time, the efficiencies have really ramped up. Now, there's a lot of challenges in terms of its commercialization. Uh, Stability is a big challenge, making sure these devices are stable over a long period of time, that they'll keep producing energy, doing what they say they're going to do. Um, But Oxford PV are really making great strides in commercializing this technology. And uh, just at the end of January, they they announced that together with the Research Institute here in Germany, the Fraunhofer ESA that they'd uh, commercialized, or not commercialized, but produced a full-scale solar module using perovskite uh, tandem material, where you take a regular solar cell and then you put a a perovskite solar cell on the top of it, and it makes for a more um, powerful, more efficient solar cell and module. And they'd managed to produce that and also in a full full size module, which is a bit of a challenge. Wow. And I think that sounds quite exciting because often when we get a technology that works, we sometimes stop and just think that must be as good as it can get. So it's exciting to know about this material innovation that is happening. But we are so familiar and comfortable with the traditional solar panels that, that we might think about and might see on people's homes, on roofs. When we are thinking about this new material in particular, are we going to see an easy rollout? Are there any barriers maybe to thinking about making this widespread? Uh, is it as durable? I guess I'm just thinking in comparison to what we're all familiar with, is it just as good? Like I think the thing is, the the bulk of solar panels are still going to be solar panels. You know, the solar panels we all know. Um, like that's a tried and true tested format. So people are going to use these new materials predominantly in a traditional panel format. But 
uh, perovskites are promising because they're kind of high efficiency and low cost. And the, that's the kind of, that's the secret sauce that you need in solar to make a technology work. But like you said, there are other applications of this technology. It is called a thin film solar technology. So it's, it is just a thin layer of that semiconductor material. And that means you can put it onto things like flexible substrates. So like a, a plastic or maybe a foil. Um, and even some consumer uh, electronic devices are now starting to deploy perovskite material um, to kind of charge them, whether that's, uh, you know, sensors and things like this, uh, fire, you know, fire alarms, fire sensors, these kind of things, they could be powered with perovskite cells in the, in the very near future. I think that is, you know, really exciting because we do have this traditional model that is tried and tested, but there are lots more applications. You've mentioned just a few. One of the things I'm interested about, I'm hoping you can help paint this picture is, I now think if you go down the street and you see a solar panel on a roof, you're totally cool with that. That is absolutely normal to see. Is solar getting into any other spaces? I'm thinking about floating solar. We were talking earlier in the podcast about space solar. You know, how, how innovative are we getting in this space? I, I think sometimes we can get a little bit carried away in looking for other places that solar can go. Like at the end of the day, the roof is probably the best place for it, right? People live in the house or they work in the factory or the warehouse and it, there's power demand there and you can put it on a roof and it's going to stay there for 25, 30, 35 years and produce energy. And that's great, you know, but there are as solar gets cheaper and it is now the cheapest energy the world has ever seen, according to the International Energy Agency. Um, there are more applications of it, right? And so you mentioned floating solar, which is really important, um, particularly in countries where there just isn't available flat land or the roofing uh, stock might not be particularly strong enough to, to carry big bulky uh, glass modules. So floating solar is promising in those kind of countries. Um, think of Southeast Asia. Japan has a lot of floating solar. Um, uh, the Netherlands have installed a lot in the Netherlands. Uh, I was speaking to an analyst the other day and she said it looks like they're just whacking solar on everything, which is, you know, it's a kind of land constrained country and they're really installing a lot of PV. So, that, yeah, there are those really promising applications, but I think we should always keep in mind that the rooftop is probably the best place. And But now I say that I, there is also with e-mobility, um, there's vehicle integrated photovoltaics, VIPV which is, is looking quite interesting because we're going to have these EVs. They're going to be you know, parked out in the street some of the time. Why not have them charging, uh, kind of trickle charging the battery or um, more to the point, they, they can kind of run things like auxiliary, like the air conditioning. So it's not drawing on the main battery. So it's kind of extending your range in that way. So wait, tell me a bit more about that, because that's quite exciting. Would this be the car has the solar panel, the road has the solar panel, a bit of both? Because I remember someone saying, wouldn't it be amazing if electric cars could charge on the roads? And that seemed like a way off. But, you know, what kind of innovation are you seeing in that space? With VIPV, it's, it's more just putting it into the vehicle, right? And some of the most promising really early applications have been things like uh, cargo bikes, electric cargo bikes. They're installing, if it's like a shared cargo bike, they can have a little solar module there that will be charging the panel when, when it's not in use. Um, also like little electric uh, vehicles, like last mile delivery vehicles, often they, they're kind of boxy and they have a bit of flat space. You can whack some solar or, or a specially produced panel can fit into that and that will kind of feed the vehicle as well. But they're really also in some kind of high-end electric vehicles. There was a Dutch startup called Lightyear that was looking to commercialize it. They were unsuccessful, but um, they did make a lot of pro prom uh, progress in terms of how do you make these special modules? How do you, f you know, a curve? shape of a car how do you fit solar panels on that or solar cells on that and really integrate it seamlessly into the fabric of the car another company sono motors in germany was trying the same so we are seeing a, a lot of innovation there and it, it is promising um, but it will be on the kind of surface of the vehicle yeah i mean i guess with all of this innovation there's probably more failures than successes in the in the run-up to getting it going but all of these companies who've tried things are really being the pioneers and i think it's exciting when you do think about all the different applications that that's possible i'm pretty sure i once saw an advert on social media for a solar panel that you could hang in your window and the, the whole point was you could maybe charge your phone on it and it was a bit of a gimmick but actually it was that idea of you know we can all use solar in these different ways even just from a window 
And I'm someone who, I'm in this kind of huge tenement flat building in Scotland. Our roof is probably not fit for solar panels. I, we also don't really get the sun, but I'm sure that's one of the arguments uh, that, that always comes up. But actually, you know, for me, it's exciting to hear about the fact that solar is happening elsewhere when, when it feels like it might not be something I can contribute to as, a, as an individual, but there are these kind of bigger places. And you mentioned these floating solar farms in a couple of those countries that are really pioneering. You know, what is the scale? You know, what's, how, how big are these things um, and, and how fast are they growing? Well, with floating solar, you can get pretty big, right? It's it's as big as the body of water, really. Um, you know, it, and when we're talking floating, I think we need to say that uh, floating uh, on the ocean, salt water, it is being developed, but that's really at the very early stages. What what is commercial um, is is floating PV on lakes and reservoirs. Um, and you ask about scale, they can get they can get huge, you know, um, tens and 20 megawatt sizes ha have really rapidly progressed to hundreds of megawatts, particularly in, in big uh, populous countries where they're really encouraging the solar industry like China and like India. Um, but lots of really interesting applications like in the Netherlands, like I was saying. And there's a number of advantages with floating solar, like it's not easy. Electricity and water are not natural friends so you know there's a, a heap of challenges there in terms of durability which you spoke to before you know water is corrosive and and so you really need to have specially uh, produced uh, solar components to make sure that they don't corrode and degrade over time but there are advantages like um, solar loves sun but it doesn't really like heat so its efficiency drops off as the solar panel gets hotter and hotter but with these floating arrays they have a way that they mount them kind of on floats that sit the module up off the water and allows air to path, pass underneath it which cools the panel therefore increasing its efficiency and I think another really exciting and encourage, encouraging development is when you couple floating solar with a hydroelectric dam so then you've got, you've already got a big, big electricity grid connection point there. So you don't need to build a new one. And then the, so the electricity that's produced by the solar, it just means you have to let less water out of the dam. So in a way, it works as a kind of virtual battery, if, if you can conceptualize it that way, because you're saving the water by producing the solar. Thereby, it's a kind of virtual sense of energy storage. It's really clever and a really promising application. Wow. And I love that kind of dual use for a space that's already been committed to when it comes to energy. And, and one of the criticisms, maybe, of some of these big hydro schemes is that really they are there in, in the sort of worst case scenario if something fails and they need to instantly get lots of energy. But often you do think there must be ways that they can get more energy from these from these places and, and solar seems like one. And I'm glad you addressed that point about electricity and water because for a minute I was just thinking, I don't know if I'm being silly, but it sounds very unlikely in the beginning, you know, but, but very exciting to know. And maybe I'm just wondering, this is new and exciting and I think any innovation in the energy space, particularly when it moves us all towards kind of net zero goals, I think is positive. But one of the things that we have talked about on the, on the podcast before is this idea of kind of communities and whether they have buy-in, whether they are comfortable and supportive, maybe even local authorities. This kind of nimbyism thing about, I don't want a wind farm in my back garden. Do we have a sense of, of people's opinions when it comes to floating solar? I think people are used to having them on their roofs and, and, and new builds in particular, getting them whacked on but but what about this is this something we, we've got a sense check on yet i haven't been aware of big community um kind of pushback against floating solar at this stage i think what needs to be um it's kind of incum incumbent on the solar industry to ensure is that there's not adverse environmental impacts, right? So some of these floats that I was telling you about that the, the solar panels can, can sit on or that they're kind of mounted onto, um, it's really important that that's not a plastic that will degrade and then go into the water source, right? So that's really important. We, we also need to make sure that any, um, uh, you know, the, the, the fish and the environment and the, and the weed and all these natural things that are in a, in a lake or in a body of water, that they're not adversely affected by covering part of the surface of the lake with solar panels. But I, I, it's also important to note that a lot of the floating solar 
um, arrays are not generally on pristine wildlife. They're not on like in national parks or, or, or these kind of places. And they also don't cover up the whole surface of the lake. You're generally talking about just part of it. Part of the reservoir will have, have a small solar system, a small in a relative sense solar system. Um, so there's still plenty of places where the light gets in. Oh, okay. I think that's reassuring because I think there is, you know, a worry that sometimes in the technology innovation space, we get a little bit too excited and maybe don't consider the impacts to people and, of course, the planet, biodiversity, wildlife. So it's really good to hear about these considerations. And I think particularly when a lot of these places will be natural, even if they're not protected, just being able to think about it. Now, one thing that you said actually back at the beginning about China, that is a huge country who is doing a lot of innovation. And when doing a little bit of research, because I knew I was going to talk to you, thinking about floating solar in particular, the, the world's largest floating array uh, is actually in China. It can generate 320 megawatts of electricity, and that's because of the 100 megawatt wind farm and battery storage facility. Um, and, you know, this is a country that is a little bit controversial in the climate space, because even though it is pushing ahead when it comes to renewable energy, it is still also investing in coal, uh, you know, even despite all of these, even in things like electric vehicles uh, and solar panels, you know, a floating solar plant twice the size is under construction in India, which, again, is another country that, that kind of comes under fire for its carbon footprint, if we just put it as simply as that. What is enabling these countries to build these projects at the scale? Is it helping to, to move them towards net zero? And... Is that something that we're doing here in the UK, the US, the West? Are we following in their, in their footsteps? China and India are, are huge countries, huge populous countries. So, you know, achieving scale is, um, is kind of what they do by definition, right? <laughs> um, and, and, and we have to note that, that China is not only the kind of biggest manufacturing hub for solar, for batteries, for EVs. It, it's also the biggest consumer of all these products by a considerable margin. So the growth of the solar industry has been exp exponential in, in recent years, and that's primarily been driven by China. Um, they have a lot of um, enabling policies um, to, to get these kind of systems built. Um, and you know part of that goes hand in hand with trying to help their manufacturers as well. But that system in China that you mentioned, I think what's really interesting with that is it's the the floating solar coupled with a wind farm, coupled with a battery, right? These are generally called hybrid arrays um, in the renewable energy space. And it's a, a really um, encouraging development because it means that, you know, the, the critics of renewable energy, they always roll out that cliche that what do you do when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow? But there's not that many times that there's no sun and there's no wind at the same time. So what it means is the, the generation profile of that combined hybrid system is relatively flat, right? So when it's windy and cloudy, um, it's not great for the solar. But when it's still and sunny, it's not great for the wind, but vice versa, they're going to produce when the other one isn't. And then you whack a battery in there as well. And then you've got pretty close to 24 seven renewable energy from that site, which is a wonderful thing and really goes a long way in um, arguing against uh, the proponents of fossil fuels who describe renewable energy as being unreliable um, because projects like this hybrid arrays can be extremely, extremely reliable. Yeah, I think that point is, is a good one as well, because traditionally, although there are different forms of oil and gas, we've got coal, we've got oil, we've got gas, they all come from fossil fuels, they all come from one place. So we are used to thinking about energy in a very singular way, because we say it all basically comes from stuff that was buried and died millions of years ago. Whereas actually renewable energy is about having that portfolio mindset and saying actually it's a little bit of this, a little bit of that, integrating it where possible. Some of it's really small scale, it's things on people's roofs. Some of it is huge scale, talking about big wind farms, big solar farms and, and having that combined approach. And of course, battery storage, You know, we want to make sure that this is something that, that can be held together. And I particularly liked even the fact that you 
were bringing in hydro there. You know, the fact that this can even be integrated into some of these big schemes. This all sounds great. And I feel this has been like a, a lesson. I feel I've learned loads. It's, it's been so interesting. And in today's podcast, I feel we've covered a lot, particularly in that innovation space. Already, I feel stretched. I feel like we're going to be seeing a lot, whether it's solar in space, solar on water. This is all great. To even push it further, I'm just wondering, you know, when I ask you, what is next for solar? Where are we going? Is there anything even beyond these exciting innovations that we've chatted about today? I think we've really, in terms of applications, we've really discussed the, the cutting edge. So VIPV, Vehicle Integrated Photovoltaics, Floating PV. Um, I think they're really encouraging. One, one thing we haven't really touched on, and it's a part of um, the industry that's really lagged behind its potential. And that's building integrated photovoltaics, so BIPV. I'm sorry, the solar industry loves an acronym. So Love an acronym. Abs- I'm learning them all today. <laughs> absolutely full of them. So, but BIPV, it's it it is really um, promising and has been a really tough nut for the solar industry to crack. So this is replacing. Um, the, the idea is to replace architectural elements in our built environment with photovoltaic elements. And there's been a lot of progress in terms of you can make a solar panel that doesn't look at all like a solar panel. It can be white. It can can have a whole array of different colors um, and shapes and sizes. But it's been very difficult for the solar industry to develop these products, learn how to make them at scale affordably, but then also to work with architects to get them to be open to these ideas. So it's kind of architects and uh, the construction industry have their set of thinking, the solar industry has their set of thinking, and it's been very difficult to bring the two together. But I think we'll see in this next generation um, of um, endeavors to decarbonize our buildings, I think uh, our built environment, right? Most of us live in cities. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of progress with uh, BIPV, or at least I hope that we make a lot of progress. Yeah. Oh, and you know, I mean, what jumps to mind when you're talking about there, it's maybe a bit of a random connection. But I remember just a couple of years ago when as consumers, we all heard about wonky vegetables, right? Wonky fruit and vegetables. So we had all these farmers saying we are growing these delicious crops. Some of them come out looking a bit funny, but they taste great. They've still got loads of nutrition and the supermarkets don't want to sell them because they think you're all very picky. And as consumers, I think the majority of us said, we're absolutely not picky. I'm happy to buy a wonky carrot or, you know, a head of lettuce that's not quite a perfect sphere. And I think there was this almost squeezing from both ends, which was the farmers saying, look, we've got amazing crops, please help us sell them. And consumers saying, we're absolutely on board with wonky veg, you know, happy to buy it. And we almost squeezed the supermarkets in the middle to sort of loosen some of the the guidelines that they had. And I guess I'm wondering if that's what needs to happen now, which is you've got the technology side, the solar PV, BIPV, I've got all the the acronyms in my head, being manufactured and, and innovated. And maybe that's what communities need to do is actually for us to say, although we, we do like a bit of style in our buildings, actually, we'd be happy to try some of these innovative things on homes and, and infrastructure and kind of squeeze that sort of planning, regulation, architectural space in the middle to, to kind of push it forward. I guess there, there's probably a role for us to kind of put our hands up and say happy to give this a go, because I think often consumers are maybe put to blame a little bit for, for the change. You know, we're picky. I, I don't know if you would agree with that. Yeah, I, I, and I think that relates to what you were saying before about, um, you know, transitioning from a fossil fuel based um, energy system to one that's electron based. Um, it, there is a different shape to it. There's a different level of complexity. It's a different way of thinking about the system, the energy system. And so I think like you were saying about consumer expectations, there's a lot of um, system change like a change of uh, how we think about these systems. And that can be from, you know, the big macro sense, how do policymakers think about it, how uh, the authorities that manage our grid, like national grid, how they think about things, how, how we think about driving our cars and what kind of energy, how we plan, how much energy is in our car. Um, and then down to like with, with BIPV, um, how architects and construction companies think about choosing building materials for their new projects. 
Absolutely. There's a role for everyone. Um, well, Jonathan, thank you so much. It's been absolutely amazing and, and really thought provoking to think about the world of solar. Um, and I think this episode is going to yeah leave people really thinking about the exciting innovation that's coming. So thank you very much and excited to see what you get up to next in the world of solar. And I'll try and remember all of those acronyms. It's an alphabet soup. Be careful, Laura. Thanks for having me thank you to everyone who has listened to this episode of the clean energy revolution